Well, thanks very much, Bill. It's a huge privilege to be here tonight honoring Heinz Pagels. You know, one of the great things about the academic life is you get to be taught things by brilliant people, even if you don't meet them in person. Or you read what they do, and it's like they're right there in the room with you. And uh, if you're really lucky, you then get to go on and teach other people things who you'll never meet. And um, so when I was a PhD student, my classmates and I, we desperately needed to know about non-abelian gauge theories, and there was Heinz Pagels teaching it to us. And we're all very grateful because you know, somehow our professors were too busy to do that. So. But that's not what I want to talk to you about tonight. And I can't really recommend that you read that particular article because it's a little bit technical. But I do really recommend that you read the books by Heinz Pagels. If I had to choose one, I think I'd choose one called The Dreams of Reason. And you know, it's such a good book that you might want to consider just quietly leaving the auditorium right now and go buying a copy and <laughs> spending the evening with Heinz instead of me, OK? Could be, a, could be a good plan. Now, before I get going on the talk, I want to give you an authentic, unfiltered experience of nature. And of course, to do that, the first step, of course, is turn off the computer, OK? So uh, second step is to turn off all the lights. OK, so could we turn off the lights, please? And uh, the third step is to turn on projector number one, Anand. So Anand is going to turn on, ah, there's projector number one. OK, so no virtual reality, no computer at all here. What you've got is some white hot piece of metal in the light bulb there. It's going through a piece of colored plastic and bouncing off the screen and into your eyes. And that's a direct, unfiltered experience of nature, OK? On the other hand, it's not such an exciting experience. Um, let's go with projector number two also, Anand. OK, um, it's a vivid experience, right? It's a vivid experience, but uh, so far, nothing particularly interesting. But Anand, I wonder if you could just twist projector number two so it lands on projector number one. And now you see something that uh, might be a little bit surprising, might cause you a little bit of alarm, especially the more you think about it. Um, what you've got here, I had those two colors, and Anand, he didn't pop out the slide and stick in another slide. He just turned those two projectors. You can see, see the red and the green around the edges, but down in the middle, you get something. And I think not one of us would call that color reddish green. And not one of us would call that color greenish red. That's some new color, OK? Your reptile brain is insisting to you that that's some new fundamental experience, nothing mixed. It's a color we call yellow, even though your intellect knows that you just saw me achieve it by mixing. So there's some cognitive dissonance there. And I'm sorry, gentlemen in the audience, uh, one out of 25 of you are not going to see the same thing that the rest of us are seeing. I'm just going to have to make that up to you later. But um, most of us are seeing something that doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't fit, OK? Uh, all right. And what comes next? Um, you know, I wonder if you could turn off uh, the red slide, Anand, and pop out the green slide. And now you've got a piece of light. That's another sensation, the sensation we're very familiar with. We usually call that white, OK? And uh, most people would say that there's no color there at all. But there, I've got this hunk of glass in my hand. And if I take that hunk of glass and intercept that light, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there come these beautiful saturated colors that didn't seem to be there before, but uh, there they are right now. Now, uh, you probably know the answer to that puzzle, but in the 17th century, people were totally baffled by this thing, and there was hot argument. There are people going along saying, well, of course, that light was colorless, and so the glass must have added the color to it. It stains the light. That's the phrase that people used to say. And uh, Isaac Newton found that he couldn't really, he couldn't really agree with that. And, uh, he did an experiment. So if I turn off projector number two on and, and get number one back on again, Isaac Newton said, well, you know, if this piece of glass is adding color to the light, then I should be able to take a color that comes from that spectrum, some pure color, and stick that chunk of glass in it and uh, generate that rainbow all over again. But you can't, OK? Uh, there it is. Uh, you take that red light, you try to generate that rainbow, and all you get is red, maybe a little yellow stuck in there as well. Okay, uh, Newton says, the only way I can interpret this is by saying that that stuff that looked like a pure singular sensation, that white light, is really a mixture. And this chunk of glass is simply separating out that mixture. If I send you something pure that's just from one band of that, then it, you can't split it anymore. It's already pure. And that's what's going on in that experiment. Um, Anand, I wonder if you could give me uh, the second projector with the green slide back in it again. So. Um, 
When I made that spectrum for you from the white light, there was one band in it that looked like yellow, and there's this thing that looked like yellow, but there's a difference. That spectral yellow, if I put this thing through it, I can't split it anymore, it stays yellow, just like the red and the green. But if I take this kind of yellow, and I stick it through the prism, oh, look, I was able to split it right back up again into red and green. You might have thought, oh, well, there's some chemical reaction between the red light and the green light, and they fuse, and they turn into some new category of object, and that's what comes into your eyes and looks like yellow. Uh-uh, no, no, no. What's coming in, into your eyes is red plus green, and I can split them apart. So here's what's so upsetting about that experiment. There's two different kinds of yellow, and they look the same to you, but physically they're different. There's the one in the spectrum that cannot be split, and there's this one that can be split. They're different, but you can't tell the difference. So what's the problem with that? Well, you know, all your life you've been told about how perfect your body is and how perfect your eyes are, and either evolution or some intelligent designer has made your eyes so perfect. How could they be so bad they can't even tell the difference between those two physically different kinds of light? Um, let me try something else on you. Get my computer back. I've added a third splotch of light up here. And there's uh, the blue plus the red, and that's magenta. There's the red plus the green, that's yellow. There's a little cyan over here. And when you add all three of them together, there's that white again. But it's not the same white as before. It's red plus green plus blue. If I send that through a, spec through a prism, I'll get three blotches of color. You know, here's what you get from the sun. You send that through a prism, and you get those that broad spectrum of light that we enjoy looking at. Most of us, how unfortunately, spend our time under fluorescent lights, and we get something like this, which is what I showed you a minute ago. Some red, some green, some blue, big dark spots in between them, and your eyes are so crappy that they can't tell the difference between those two kinds of light. Doesn't seem right, something doesn't fit. I think I'm all done with the projectors on that, thanks. We can get a little light back, too. So maybe you're saying to yourself, oh, come on, why is he insulting my intelligence with this baby demonstration? I came here to hear about the cosmic mysteries, and all he's showing me is this thing that I already saw in middle school. Well, sorry if you feel that way. Uh, I'm going to stop right now and begin to talk. But first, let me ask, are you sure you really saw it in school? And when I was in school, I just heard people standing around claiming it was true. Nobody actually gave me the experience like I just gave to you. And uh, I have to admit, I never bothered to give it to myself until too many years had gone by. Or I read it in books, and they're claiming things too. OK, there's a point coming up. As a nation, we're sort of, turning, we're sort of losing the distinction between reality and virtual reality. And uh, we're turning into this big Pixar nation. Because virtual reality, it's so smooth, it's so seductive, it's so superior to real reality in certain ways that uh, you lose track of that. But really, you know, virtual reality, I could have shown that to you on the computer screen, but basically it's no different from me just standing here making bald-faced claims at you. Okay? You've got to trust the guy who's saying that to not be making a mistake, to not be trying to fool you, and to actually know what's going on and things like that. And, uh, you know, there's a problem with experts. You've got to trust me to be an expert. The problem with experts, you know, I like something Richard Feynman said, you've got to learn from science that you have to doubt experts. In fact, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. That's what Richard Feynman told us. So all right, you saw something with your own eyes, you make up your own mind, okay? Maybe I'll guide you a little bit, but at least we're standing on something firm. And anyway, it's fun, and fun is good. I only have two topics tonight. This is the beginning of the talk, by the way. Um, first thing is, what is color and how do we see it? And there's a subtext behind that one. Uh, if you know what the answer to that question, then maybe you could make a gadget that discriminates color better than humans. It might be good for something. Second point is, what sets the ultimate limit to our visual sensitivity? And are we anywhere close to that limit? And of course, there's a subtext to that one too. If you, make a, if you understand that, you might be able to make a gadget that could use that insight to do something useful. So to tell you those two topics, I'm gonna have just four big ideas. And by the way, that's the, that's the progress bar up there, so you won't have to keep looking at your watch. Okay. <laughs> Point number one, understanding your own body sometimes requires the coolest and the neatest and the newest physics ideas. I like that. Sometimes a simple physical measurement can give you some insight into how things work way, way sooner than ought to have been possible. I'm going to tell you a little story about that. 
But sometimes that measurement has to be connected with some mathematical analysis. Oh no, oh my God, math, it's the M word. Put yourself in my hands, okay? Uh, it's only gonna be for an hour, how bad could it be? And uh, I think you'll get the point. Once you understand even partly how nature has done even one of these cool tricks that nature knows how to do, then you gain practical benefits sometimes. Now, you know, we're supposed to be thinking about truth and beauty too, and I gotta say, I also like the fact that it's also beautiful. Maybe you'll agree with me and maybe you won't. So, I wanna tell you a little secret. A little self-revelation, something I've never told anyone in my whole life. Do you believe it? Are you ready? Okay, when I was a kid, I had this fantasy. Wait for it. I imagined that I was this high-tech Cold War spy. Oh, great, give me a break, you know, you're saying to yourself, doesn't he know that two out of three little boys had that exact same fantasy? Yeah, well, I know that, but um, why do you think I never told anybody? Okay, but unlike them, I sort of grew up to do that. I mean, I sort of grew up. And uh, there's a point I want to make here. That's why I'm giving you this painful self-revelation. There's an analogy between scientific research and espionage that I want to draw on. You know, we've got these complex, distant adversaries like cancer or climate change or something like that. We have all these agents out in the field that are just trying to find something useful to do about that. There's a far-flung network of these agents, and some of us, our mission is obviously relevant. You know, infiltrate that factory and see what they're making. That's called applied research. Others of us are uh, sitting there looking at the big picture, trying to understand what's going on in the world, looking for things that don't fit. Things that don't fit. Sometimes you can mine that into some nugget, could be useful for somebody. You know, just like real spies, we're often not as glamorous as the fictional ones. Although I can't help pointing out, guys, look, 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 look at that receding hairline, huh, huh? I'm just saying, all right? I don't know, just saying, but uh, sometimes you spend a lot of effort and you wind up getting something that you have to admit didn't do anybody any good. Sometimes the work's kind of mundane, sometimes it's lonely, okay, but once in a while you get that nugget. Maybe it's not a nugget that has anything to do with what you thought you were going to discover, but some master spy can figure out where it fits and get something good out of it. That's my metaphor for science. Oh yes, and sometimes there really is a high-tech gizmo that even James Bond himself would have been proud to employ. Maybe it's a gizmo that was invented for some completely different purpose, but a good spy has this lateral thinking thing where you say, oh yeah, I need that nugget of information, maybe this gizmo would do it. I can give you an old-fashioned example. You know, some guy sticks two lenses together, makes a telescope, he says, ah, I can put it on the horizon, see ships coming in, gain a commercial advantage by being the first person who sees the ships coming in. Like, three months later, Galileo gets a hold of one of these things, looks up at the sky and says, hmm, hmm, I see some stuff going around, something that's not the sun. Revolution in science, okay? That's the kind of spycraft that I have in mind. That's not the story I want to tell you tonight. It's like the story I want to tell you tonight. I'm going to tell you one that maybe isn't quite so familiar. Right, so the talk, the talk, the talk. Well, we had our direct experience of nature already. Then I'm going to tell you about color. Then I want to tell you a little bit about the quantum theory of light. So color has always fascinated humans. Humans have been talking about it since the ancient Greeks, if not before. But it's also very useful to animals like us. You look around the world and you see this jumble of confusing sensations. You have to segment your visual world into objects. And luckily, different objects have different colors. If you've got color vision, it really helps to segment the world into objects. And once you've done that, it really helps to figure out what they are, which is which. And in particular, at some point in our evolutionary history, uh, it was really important for our ancestors to be able to distinguish ripe fruit from unripe fruit. You know, there you are in the trees, it's gonna save you a whole lot of time if you don't have to go over there, grab that fruit, stick it in your mouth, and see whether it's ripe or not. If you've got the right kind of color vision, you can just look at it and see. It's good for figuring out whether that person over there is the same species as you or not, and if not, just ignore them. Uh, it's good, some animals use color for emotional signaling. Is that guy about, is that guy about to attack me or not? Or uh, are you saying back off because I'm about to attack you, that kind of, we use color for that. Okay, color, it's useful. I mean, color vision is useful, but not quite simple, right? We've made this uncomfortable observation that our eyes discard a lot of information about the spectrum of light. A lot of information comes into your eyes that doesn't make it into your brain, like the difference between those two kinds of yellow or those two kinds of white. So there's something we gotta figure out, but you know, when there's something that doesn't fit, doesn't fit, 
that's an intellectual opportunity. Uh, doesn't fit our notions about our perfect eyes. Maybe it's a chance to learn something. And the minute you get an intellectual opportunity, there's a technological opportunity that comes right after it. Maybe there's some way that I could view color that would not involve discarding that information. Could be useful. So here's some splotches of light. We know about that one. It's the whole spectrum. We know about that one. It's just one end of the spectrum. And that's the middle, and that's the other end of the spectrum. And there's this one that could get split into just the red and the green. Here's one that we haven't talked about yet very much. It's magenta. Uh, you, sh you saw it on the screen a little while ago. Whoops. There we go. Come back. Yeah, OK. Uh, it's got the red, it's got the blue, and it has hardly got any green in the middle. It's red and blue without the green in the middle. That's the spectrum that co causes magenta. And the cyan is something similar as well. Now, I want you to keep those images in mind as we find another way of representing that. There's white light. I can put it through a prism. I get this smear of colors. There's equal amounts of everything. I want to, you to get used to thinking about this as a graph. Okay, on this axis, we've got which, where you are in the spectrum, which of those spectral colors we're talking about. And on this axis, we've got how much of that color is present. So white light has got a broad, flat top, about equal amounts of blue, green, and red. That's what we call white light. Whereas that magenta, uh, it's got a lot of blue, it's got a lot of red, hardly any green. So we'll write that as a graph with bumps in it. There's a bump in the blue, there's a valley in between, and there's a bump in the red. Whenever you see these graphs in this talk, I want you to think about these smears of color that uh, they're representing. So the hero of our story is a guy named Thomas Young. Fascinating character. You know, first he got a medical degree, but he never liked sick people. So first, he, so he had to uh, revolutionize science in a way that I'm going to tell you about tonight. But then he got sort of bored with physics as well and started uh, translating the Rosetta Stone. You know, one of those great guys that has a restless intellect. Let's stick with what he said about physics. He made a chain of reasoning that was incredibly modern for 1801. Started out with things that he'd already learned from Isaac Newton. He said, well, okay, light comes in different flavors. I'm going to call those the spectral colors. Magenta is not one of them, right? It's like I'm talking red, green, and blue. Even when you mix those colors, those, those kinds of light, those flavors retain their distinct character and can be separated once again. You just saw that, right? That was your direct experience. Uh, other colors involve the relative amounts in the mixture of those flavors. That's what determines color. And our eyes must contain some mosaic of little pixels. Here they are, like in your cell phone camera. Um, each one of these is a living cell in the retina in the back of your eye. And uh, each one of those has a line to the brain. That's how you represent a complex visual scene. Each one is measuring something about the light landing on it and telling the brain about it. And all the brain can possibly know about color is what it hears those cells saying. That's the modern thing. Incredible for 1801. Your brain can't tell anything. It's got no sensory organs of its own. All it knows is what's coming in the pipes. And what's coming in the pipes is information from these photoreceptor cells. Anything they can't tell, the brain can't tell either. And Young goes a little further, his key point. Every photoreceptor cell, he says, let's suppose it's only sensitive to a particular range of colors. The cells are tuned to particular colors. That's Young's big idea. Now, what's this thing about tune? That sounds like music. We're not talking about music. We're talking about light. And how could a receptor cell be tuned? Well, Young at that time, there's another thing that he said in 1801. Uh, light, sound, they both have a lot of properties. They exhibit a lot of properties that are similar to waves on the surface of water. And uh, waves have a frequency. Different waves are distinguished by their frequencies. And um, there's something about frequency called resonance. If you blow through an organ pipe, it's going to sing. It's going to sing with a musical note with a particular frequency that's got something to do with the dimensions of that pipe, how big it is, low notes from big pipes, and so on and so forth. So OK, a couple of year, hundred years go by, and we can illustrate this very beautifully now. Here are some test tubes. Each one's got a suspension of little crystals in it. Those crystals are all exactly the same chemical. They're all cadmium, sul sul they're all cadmium sulfide. They're all exactly the same chemical. It's just that they were allowed to crystallize for different amounts of time. These are all little crystals. These are all big crystals, and there's everything in between. When you put them under black light, they glow in different colors, having to do with the physical dimensions of the crystals, which are tuned to separate colors. Now, that's not exactly what we want. That's emitting light. We're talking about detecting light. But uh, I think you know quite well, if you sing to your guitar, you sing a note to your, some of you maybe play guitar, right? You sing a note to your guitar. Um, only one string is likely to respond, the one that's in tune with the note that you're singing at it. At least if you sing better than me. Uh, guitar string only responds to a particular range of frequencies. So Thomas Young says, 
Maybe the spectral color thing is a kind of frequency. Maybe the receptor cells contain something in them that's selective because of some kind of resonance idea. Specifically, let's suppose that receptor is responsive, let's suppose that the receptor's response to one spectral color is the product of what you get when you multiply the intensity of the light at that color times the sensitivity at that color. It's some linear relationship. That's what some mathematician would say. So let's get, let's, uh, here are the points that I had already from Young, and here are the new points. We're going to add to these hypotheses that each photoreceptor has a distinct sensitivity range, and they come in only three classes. Every photoreceptor cell lies in one of these three classes, and every one in that class is completely identical to every other one in that class, but there's three different kinds. Okay, that's Young's hypothesis. What's it got to do with our paradox? Well, you, here's another kind of spectrum. It's not the same spectrum as before. On this axis, we've still got what kind of color I'm talking about, blue, green, red. But on this axis, instead of how much light is present, we've got how much light is needed to make that receptor cell respond. Or put it the other way, it's how sensitive that receptor cell is. So there's three different kinds making three different curves. I only drew two of them. There's this one that uh, peaks at the green and is especially sensitive to green light. There's this one that peaks in the red, is especially sensitive to red light. And there's this blue one that we're not going to talk about. If I send spectrally pure yellow light in, it's going to land at the intersection of those two curves and both the green receptor and the red receptor are going to respond equally strongly. If I send in pure green light, then the green receptor is going to respond a lot and the red receptor not very much, and vice versa if I send in red light. But now if I send in a mixture, some of this and some of that in equal amounts, then I'm going to add those two responses and once again, the two receptor cells are going to be saying about the same thing. They're going to be responding about equally strong and I'm going to get the same message going to the brain as if I had sent in spectrally pure light. That's the origin of that ambiguity, says Thomas Young. All the brain can know is what the receptor cells tell it, and since you're testing the light that's coming in with just these three sensitivity functions, there's this ambiguity. There's two different ways to get the same response. That's Young's great idea. Let me summarize that. There were a lot of ideas there. Pure spectral light has a continuously varying property. I'm going to call that the spectral color. There are all kinds of mixtures possible. You can draw any graph at all, and that corresponds to some kind of light, some kind of mixture. There's billions of different kinds of mixtures you can make, a huge variety of spectra, but our eyes are only sampling those spectra with just three sensitivity curves, sending just three signals to the brain for every pixel. Each sense depends linearly on the incoming spectrum, and all your brain can know are those three signals, and that's where you've got an ambiguity in your color discrimination. It's a loss of some information that's coming into your eyes, but not getting out to your brain. Whoa, way ahead of its time. Remember, the year is 1801. No one had ever seen a photoreceptor cell back then. And even when they did, you know, many decades later, when people started to be able to see photoreceptor cells, they all looked exactly the same. You don't see any three classes. Anatomically, they're indistinguishable. It took 163 years before somebody made the crucial measurement, which I'll tell you about tonight, to confirm Thomas Young's hypothesis. Whoa, good spycraft, I would say. Of course, so, so great, we're done. We saw something weird in the first part of this talk. We found a hypothesis, seems to explain it, ready to reap those golden rewards, call it the venture capitalists. Whoa. There's a problem with being 163 years ahead of your time, and the problem is peer review. Okay? You can take a lot of flack when you're 163 years ahead of your time. Peer review just wasn't, based, wasn't built to handle it. Here's a review that Young got. Difficult to deal with an author, blah, we've searched without success for any trace of learning, acuteness, and ingenuity, blah, blah, blah. A savage review, okay? What are you going to do? Every scientist has had this experience, right? What are you going to do at that moment in your life? Are you going to just crumple up and die? Not necessarily. Now, you know, people who popularize science, they often think they're doing you a favor by collapsing a scientific story down to two steps, okay? Let me go through it with you. Step one, there's Albert Einstein. He's this transcendent genius. He's sitting in a chair. He notices his butt pushing against the chair, and he has this great idea. Step two, and then we got GPS and lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, there are two things I don't like about that story, okay? Thing one, if you're some young person imbibing these stories, after a while you get the point. Oh yeah, I'm not a transcendent genius. I can't play this game. This has got nothing to do with me. Thing two, if you're a not-so-young person, a person who pays taxes, perhaps, 
uh, you hear enough of those stories and it start, you start to say, well, well, why does the government support science anyway? Why does it cost so much, you know? There's always gonna be one or two transcendent geniuses on the planet and throwing a lot more money at it won't make any more than that. And anyway, he had a day job when he had that good idea, you know? And as for the GPS, that's industry. That's what industry does, you know? They make money building stuff. So um, why do you have to fund science? So the point, of course, is that in between step one and step two, there's this humongous middle step that people leave out. It's called scientific research. And it does cost money, okay? And what I want to tell you about tonight is one of my texts is uh, what scientific research is really all about. But first, let me answer those two hypothetical people. To that young person, I would say, a whole lot of science is actually carpentry. It's actually craftsmanship, okay? There's meticulous patient craftsmanship. You gotta build a one-off device or method that's never been built before, that's gonna tease out that nugget of information that's gonna advance your spy craft. That's uh, what a lot of science is, and a whole lot of people have those qualities and can do it. Well, to person number two, I've already said that scientific research does cost money, and in this country, unfortunately, industry has basically stopped doing it, okay? There's a long way to go. Now, well-meaning people, when they tell these stories, you know, they generally think, oh, it would hurt your little brains if I told you about that middle step, or you might be bored for a minute, we can't have that, but uh, that's what I wanna do tonight. If I end up demystifying scientists for you, so that you can no longer look at us as mumbo jumbo voodoo priests, well, that's a good outcome. I'd like that. Right, so here's Thomas Young, he has a good idea, he gets a bad referee report, you gotta nail the case. And he didn't actually do that, it took a little while to do it, but uh, you gotta find a way to nail the case. And what you need, physicists are the people who believe that to nail the case, you need quantitative, detailed predictions from your theory. If your theory predicts 100 numbers, and you go to the lab and you make your measurements, and those numbers could come out correctly within their appropriate error bars, uh, it's probably not an accident. Probably means that theory was, um, promising. Lots of theories fail right there at that point and get tossed into the trash. So that's what physicists like to do. It's our discipline. Don't go too far on a tangent without some authority from experiment. Ideally, we'd like a whole lot more experimental data points than we have unknown parameters. How do you do it in this case? Well, here's a classic experiment that was done by many people. You take a kind of light, maybe it's magenta, some light that I'm going to call the target light. A human subject is looking at it projected onto half the screen. Then there are these three standard lights, maybe they're red, green, and blue, and maybe there's some other choice, but they're three standard lights, and the subject has got these three knobs. And you say to the subject, okay, dial those knobs, please, until you get a perfect match, and you can't tell the difference between the two halves of the screen, if it can be done, okay? Uh, that generates a lot of data. That generates data that look like this. Here are a bunch of different target lights, all sorts of different target lights. You ask the subject to do that task, and for each one, the subject coughs out three numbers, how much red, how much green, how much blue, that's what these three curves are, that's the quantity of red, green, and blue light needed to match that light. If you can make a theory that predicts all that, might be a promising theory, don't you think? That's a lot of quantitative data. How's it work? Well, once you've measured those sensitivity curves, uh, here they are for humans and other primates, we've got red and green, and yes, they do overlap quite a lot, and there's blue off to the side, there's an interesting reason for that. I don't want to get into it. But those are the sensitivity curves. And once you've measured them, you can predict the response of each of those three photoreceptor cells to any kind of spectrum of incoming light. Just color by color, you multiply how much of that color there is times the sensitivity at that color. You add them all up, and that's your answer. Okay? You do that to the target light, you get three numbers. Then you do that to the three uh, standard lights, and you get numbers. And then you say, what combination of those standard lights is needed to mimic the response elicited by the target light? Okay? Mathematically, it boils down to solving three, three linear equations. And I'm allowed to say that to you because I just recently discovered that high school students now do that uh, in high school, solve three linear equations and three unknowns. So what happens? Well, here's that graph before, but I didn't tell you everything about that graph. These solid curves are the experimental data that came off the experiment. These dots are the predictions of theory uh, with no free adjustable parameters at all. Once you measure those sensitivity curves, the die is cast, there's no wiggle room, there's no fudge factors, and it comes out on the money. It's very strong evidence for that theory. That's what scientists do all day long, is try to get something that good. Costs a lot of effort. Okay, now we're ready for some technological payoffs. We've, we've uh, done our homework. Uh, you can fool the eye into thinking that a whole range of colors is present. 
If you take a look at an old-fashioned television set with a magnifying glass while it's on, you see it doesn't have millions of colors. It has three colors. It's got red, green, and blue glowing things. And just by adjusting the relative proportions of that, the television is able to mimic all the millions of colors that we like to see, and similarly with computer screens. So that's cool. That's technology. It's not very recent technology. But let's turn it around. What this means, the fact that you can match a lot of colors with just three means that our eyes are discarding a lot of information about the spectrum of light entering any given visual field. And we could ask ourselves, could some artificial visual system do better than that? Now that you know about our eyes, it opens your eyes, so to speak, to something you could do better. You know, if you're going to have a baby, you might get genetic counseling. You might get genetic testing. And what do they do? They don't, they don't sequence the whole genome. No, no, only Bill Gates gets that, you know. <clears throat> but there's an old test that reveals a lot of problems called karyotyping. Uh, you take cells and you stain the chromosomes at the right point in the division cycle, and you used to snip them out with scissors and line them up so you see they come in pairs, right? And, and here's one chromosome and its partner, and here's another and its partner, and you look at them, and if you see that, well, there's three copies of this chromosome and there's only supposed to be two, that's a bad sign. If there's only one and there's supposed to be two, that's a bad sign. If one of these has a whole huge chunk missing, that's a bad sign. It's kind of a blunt instrument, isn't it? It's useful. It lets, it, uh, lets a lot of things, it, it, it catches a lot of things. But wouldn't it be nice if you could take each one of those chromosomes, take chromosome number one and paint it all one color, chromosome number two, paint it all some other color, maybe you'd learn more like that. So this is not a talk about molecular biology. So all I'm going to say is that uh, smart people like my friend Yuval Garini know how to do that. And uh, great, he's labeled all the chromosomes, each with its own color. Doesn't tell you much, does it? The colors that are available in fluorescent dyes uh, are not really all that distinguishable to our eyes. Uh, you look at this, and uh, if there's more than, say, two colors, it's hard to say what's going on. But maybe we could do better than that. Suppose instead of three sensitivity functions, you tested that each pixel of the image with 10 or 100. If you have these narrow sensitivity functions, you could tell the difference between yellow and green plus red because yellow would excite only this one, and green plus red would excite only those two, and they're different, and you could tell the difference. You'd get better color discrimination. Well, there's a gizmo that does that. It's a Sanyak interferometer. I wish I had time to tell you about how it works, but effectively what it does is it takes every pixel in the image sends it through a prism, spreads it out into its spectrum, sees how much of each color is present, and turns that into a graph. Okay? That's what the interferometer does. And uh, it's a gizmo that was invented. Physicists think of the this particular gizmo uh, as something that was used to uh, confirm some predictions of the Einstein's theory of general relativity, not for this purpose. Other people think about it as useful in the guidance of ballistic missiles. A good spy has a whole catalog of all the gadgets out there when some new nugget of in intelligence needs to be found. What's it do for you? Um, here are two popular fluorescent dyes. One's called Psi-3 and one's called Texas Red. The green line is the spectrum of Psi-3. The blue line is the spectrum of Texas Red. Um, they're similar, but they're not quite the same. These peaks are a little bit off. Those peaks have a different height. But if you just look at it with your eye, you're going to see red. There's 600 nanometers. And uh, this you can't see because it's infrared. You look at this with your eye. You can't tell the difference. There's a third curve here. That's what happens when you have both of them present. It's the sum of those two spectra. If you label all of chromosome 7 with Psi 3 and all of chromosome 13 with Texas Red and all of chromosome 4 with a combination, you get a picture that looks like this. And once again, not very interesting, not very useful. Hasn't told us much. But you can do better than that. Each pixel on this picture, you can send it through that interferometer and make a digital decision. Which of these three curves does it most resemble? You know it's got to be one of those three because that's what you labeled it with. Okay? That digital decision can be rather uh, precise. And then once you've made your decision, you can change that color into some fake color that humans are good at discriminating and get a more informative picture. OK, the doctor can see you now. OK, these guys are a pair. Those guys are a pair. Now you can see what's going on. That's the spectral karyotyping idea. That's what I mean by superhuman color vision. Let's go back to this. This is an actual karyotype from a guy whose uh, son was born with mental retardation. That's a bad thing. Chromosomes look pretty good until you look at the spectral karyotype when you see a whole big chunk of one chromosome has been swapped with another. Everything that's supposed to be there is there, but in the wrong place. There's some gross abnormality there that uh, ordinary karyotyping was powerless to reveal. 
I think that's pretty good. Here's another one. This one looks all scrambled up. This is the karyotype from a cancer cell. Okay. We're entering a period of personalized medicine. Uh, different strains of cancer cells have different uh, karyotypes. They have different genetic sequences. Someday there's going to be an app for your doctor's iPad that says this strain is sensitive to that drug and not sensitive to that drug. And uh, this is one of those techniques, one of many, that are going to start giving us personalized medicine. Mm, here's one I like a lot. This is a karyotype from my cousin. But don't worry, he's okay. He's your cousin too. This is a primate. It's a given. Okay? And when people say to you, oh yeah, those primates, they've got 99% the same DNA as we do, it's true as far as it goes. Look, every label that sticks to our chromosomes also sticks somewhere to his chromosomes. But look at all that shuffling that's been going on. This picture is full of clues about our evolutionary lineage. It's pretty interesting. It tells you something you couldn't see without superhuman color vision. Here's another example. If you take a slice of brain tissue and you just stick it under the microscope and look at it, it's a mess. There's this tangle, this dense tangle of all these things tucked cheek by jowl. They're long, skinny things. You can't see anything. You can't discriminate anything. Would it be cool if you could take every neuron in a slice of brain, give it its own different color, stain it uniformly all up and down its whole length with its personal color, which is different from the colors of its neighbors, then you could see a lot more. That's the brain bow method. It works essentially by the same mechanism I've just told you about. Now you can see what's going on in there. Uh, you can also see it in three dimensions. That's pretty nice. And you can also see who's connected to who and how. Here's a neuron, and you see its output is connected to this other neuron's input, and it winds around. You get all sorts of fantastic detail. There's a whole new branch of science called connectomics that didn't exist until methods such as this. This is not the only method. Started coming online in just the past few years. Now we're going to be able to see things we couldn't ever see before because we have superhuman color vision. So that's it for part one. If we didn't get that understanding of our own vision with its failings, we might never have imagined the possibility of doing better, nor the beans to do so. That's what I mean when I say spycraft. You know, when people say truth is beauty and beauty is truth, you know, I kind of glaze over because usually they're just blowing smoke at you. But um, I couldn't help feeling when I looked at those brain pic bow pictures that I'd seen it somewhere before. So I'm, I'm lying on my back getting my root canal a couple, of years, a couple of days ago, and suddenly it popped into my head. I got this vision. Oh, yes, it's this painting by Ted Geisel. He doesn't look familiar. You may know him by his pen name. So I do believe, though, that great art can reveal to us truths that are not visible yet to empirical science. And in that connection, I'd just like to draw your attention to that little worm there. Uh, empirical science hasn't seen that yet. This, you know, Professor Pagels, this may be more in your line than in my line, but uh, just remember who you heard that from first, okay? Okay, great. We did a fun demo, told a fun story, got some good applications. Let's go for a hike or something, or whatever you do in Aspen. Well, yeah, but hang on a minute. There are a couple of small matters left. I haven't really told you what is light. I haven't really told you what is this color content that I keep talking about. I haven't really told you what this tooting is all about. It's just a metaphor so far. And mathematically, there was that crucial relation that had that mathematical property of linearity. I didn't tell you where that came from or why it should be true. I didn't tell you where those sensitivity curves came from and how you, should, how you could measure them. I kind of snookered you so far. Can we learn something more specific about light and about our eyes? And if so, hmm, might have some practical value. That seems to be how, how it works. Well, the minute you start poking into nature, you start finding things that uh, don't seem right, things that don't fit. What happens, you know, we can detect very dim light, but when the light gets very dim, then your detector stops working, you know, isn't able to see it. As technology increases, though, I've been, we've been able to invent gizmos that are extremely sensitive to light, and now we see something disturbing happens when you send them very dim light. Okay, here's the output from a uh, avalanche photodiode. Um, this is time, and this is the voltage coming off that thing. If I give it super dim illumination, I see noise, 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 blip, noise, 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 blip. I see these great big honking blips on top of the noise. If I crank the intensity of the light up a little bit, I don't see bigger blips. This is slightly brighter light, slightly brighter light. I see the exact same blips, but just a little more frequent. That's not what we expected light to be doing. Light seems to be lumpy, okay? Long before this, Albert Einstein, also a guy ahead of his time, was forced to that conclusion in 1905. Something doesn't fit in the older picture of light. 
What are we going to say about that? Now, you may be saying, hey, hey, hold your horses, Phil. That doesn't mean that the light is discontinuous. You go to any water park and you'll find this device, your water pours continuously into it, and it goes dump, dump, dump. Something continuous comes in, and out come these clicks, like those, uh, like those little blips that I showed you before. Uh, it doesn't mean that light itself is discontinuous. It, 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 it is discontinuous. Yeah, well, that's true, but uh, think about it for a minute. That thing, if I s take care to send in water at a uniform rate, then that thing is going to go click, 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 click at a uniform rate. It's going to give uniformly spaced clicks. And that's not what those graphs look like. They look kind of random. Now, you know, one popular way to get information off the apparatus and into your brain is visually. You make a graph and you look at the graph. Our visual cortex is good at deciphering spatial relationships. It's a good way of getting, but it's not the only way to get data into your brain. Um, there are other routes into your brain. There's the auditory cortex as well. If this was true, then I, make a, I could just put a loudspeaker on that detector, and I ought to hear something like this. Uh, okay, it's a harsh sound, but it's definitely a musical note. It's a couple octaves below middle C. Okay, uh, is that what we get or not? So uh, I asked my PhD student to uh, just turn off the laser in his experiment and just have the detector going with only stray light, and uh, we put it through a loudspeaker. It did not sound like a musical note. That's photon shot noise. That's a signal, that's a series of blips, which is not only random, it's as random as possible for a given average rate. So something about light is not only lumpy, it's also intrinsically random. It's upsetting news for a lot of physicists but uh, we've learned to get used to it. Now, lumpy character of light brings out another interesting feature. When you get down to very few lumps, here's a guy who set up a camera, normal camera, you know, some lenses, and on the back plane, he had a very sensitive detector of light, and uh, he illuminated the subject very dimly, and out comes this random collection of dots. You might think it's a map of the sky or something like that. If he cranked, when he cranked up the illumination a little bit more, he got some more dots, but now you start to see something interesting. There are regions where not so many dots are coming per second, and other regions where lots of dots are coming per unit second. That's how light builds up an image. What we think of as an image, it's not really a, it's not really a continuous distribution of the intensity of light. It's a continuous distribution of the probability of arrival of those discrete random blips. That's what an image is. That's that randomness of light once again. That's not some simulation, that's experimental data. So uh, let's frame a hypothesis based on what we've seen so far. Maybe we should, could be able to test it. Okay, light comes in lumps, I'm going to start calling them photons. Each of those lumps has a distinguishing quality. It's carrying along with it a number, and that number is its spectral color. Those lumps arrive at random no matter how hard you try to make a steady light. That thing we call brightness is the average rate of arrival, the probability per second for them to arrive. That color content, that light spectrum I was telling you about, is just a list of those average arrival rates for each type of lump. There's the rate at which the red ones come, and there's the rate at which the green ones come, and so on. That's the meaning of the light spectrum that I've been talking about without defining it in this talk till now. And an image is just a spatial modulation in those average rates. I'm not done. Let's start talking about vision, our eyes. <clears throat> I want to add some points to that. Some single molecule in a photoreceptor cell can flip like a toggle from one shape to another when a photon comes by, absorbing it. There's, there's precedent for that sort of thing to happen. Uh, when baby's born prematurely, he's got too much bilirubin, you stick him under a blue light and it flips all those bilirubin molecules. Or the photon can pass right by it without any effect on the molecule or on itself, and it lands someplace else. The choice of whether that photon gets absorbed or not is random, but it has some probability. It's not 50-50, it has some probability. And what is that probability? The probability to be absorbed depends on what kind of molecule. Is it a little one or a big one? There's that size thing we talked about before. That's where the tuning comes in. And also, what was the color of that photon? That's what I mean by the sensitivity curve. It's that list of probabilities for any particular molecule, the probabilities for each different color of light to get absorbed and make it flip. It's just a hypothesis, right? I haven't proved it to you. Those three kinds of photoreceptor cells, each one is packed with billions of just one of those three, of the three kinds of sensitive molecules. And then there's some apparatus inside that cell that counts, an integer, it counts how many molecules flipped in a given instant of time and reports that to the brain. 
That's my right hypothesis. Based on things we've seen, but there's some extra things that definitely are crazy. So there you go, I've answered all those vexing questions, but with a lot of new and crazy ideas. Better have some experiment that could confirm or destroy a theory like that before I go about <laughs> claiming I know something. And right away, before we even do that, you could object. You could say, well, even if it's true, this photon stuff, it can't have anything to do with our eyes. When you work out the numbers, you see that each one of those photons carries an inconceivably small amount of energy, many orders of magnitude less than what you get when you drop a grain of sand on your hand, and that's the smallest thing your skin can detect. How could your eyes detect anything that small? It's, it's very unlikely. It's like uh, Calvin here, you know, Calvin's got an interesting idea, but he doesn't know that brain waves are much too weak to be detected by a colander on top of your head. But, you know, it may be implausible, but if you've got slightly better night vision than the guy next to you, that gives you an enormous evolutionary advantage. You might be able to eat that guy, or you might be able to avoid getting eaten by that guy. Okay? There's a huge evolutionary pressure to get as good night vision as possible. Nature will have tried very hard to go all the way to the absolute limit of sensitivity. And by the way, now we know there is an absolute limit of sensitivity. If light comes in lumps, there's nothing between zero and one. The absolute limit of sensitivity is one photon. It sounds unlikely, but maybe we ought to look into it and see whether our eyes are that good. Then along the way, we'd get a little, uh, oh yeah, by the way, Calvin, he does have a key idea. I want to keep my ideas grounded in reality. So do we. So let's think of some experiment. We've got to make a prediction, and it's kind of a weird kind of prediction. So let's suppose. Let's suppose our rays really could respond to individual photon absorption events. Seems crazy. So if we place a photoreceptor cell in total darkness and give it very dim flashes of light, that light hypothesis predicts there must be some unavoidable randomness in its response. And I made a little simulation here. Uh, uh, each of these little dots is one of those photosensitive molecules there in a big stack inside the photoreceptor cell. And each one has a certain probability per unit time of going flip when I give it the flash of light. And uh, well, each one, you know, some random pattern of them gets flipped. If I run that simulation again with the exact same flash of light landing on the exact photorecept same with photoreceptor cell, since it's probabilistic, we won't get the same answer. Okay? Different photoreceptor cells get elected, uh, molecules get elected, and furthermore, the total number is also different. That's going to result, according to our hypothesis, in a different signal getting sent to the brain. I can do it a third time, same simulation, same sensitivity, same intensity of the light, and this time we got a different number. Every time we get a different number. What kind of prediction is that? We're supposed to nail the case before we move on to juicy applications, but uh, we're trying to make a quantitative falsifiable prediction, but how can you make a quantitative test of a theory that freely admits that every time you do it, it will be different? Doesn't science demand repeatability? Isn't that what science is all about? And what's an important point? Quite a lot of science, in quite a lot of science, your prediction is actually statistical. It's not telling you what's going to happen every single time. And you can test such a prediction, but not with a single trial. You have to make a lot of trials. The more trials you make, the greater the conviction that you get that your hypothesis is either working or failing. What we're predicting is not how many, how strong a signal we'll get. What we're predicting is the probability distribution, the histogram of what happens over many trials of identical flashes of light. So that light hypothesis and a little simulation like the one I just showed you lets us predict mathematically how much randomness we should expect to see if that hypothesis is true. That's what we can compare to the performance of real eyes. So here's a magnificent tour de force piece of spy craft. It's an experiment done by uh, Dennis Baylor and his colleagues over many years. Um, here's some retina. You start with a salamander and you move up from there. And um, got a lot of photoreceptor cells. And one of them has been gently aspirated into this pipette. It's a highly magnified picture. The pipette is very narrow. Uh, one of them has been gently aspirated in that pipette. And you can see what's going on with the cartoon here. There's an electrode inside the pipette. There's an electrode outside the pipette. Current that would have flowed from one end of the cell to the other can't do that because the pipette is in the way. It has to take the long way around, go through the measuring apparatus, and uh, make a measurement. That's how you can measure the response of one individual photoreceptor cell. Yeah, an amazing experiment, OK? You've got to have good electronics. You have to have good spy craft. And here's the results. You send the same flash of light over and over. Sometimes you get nothing coming out. 
Sometimes you get a peak of one picoampere of current, sometimes you get a peak of two picoamperes of current, um, but you get responses, it turns out, that fall nicely into these separate categories. It's very tempting to suppose that this is a case where no molecules got flipped, one molecule got flipped, two molecules got flipped. Very tempting to suppose that, but we gotta do the acid test. What's the acid test? Well, you gotta compare that sort of data, you gotta turn it into a histogram and compare it to the experiment, to the theory, pardon me. So here's what the theory predicts. If you give a very weak flash of light, mostly you'll get nothing. This is a histogram. Most of the time you'll get zero picoamperes, and once in a while you'll get one and hardly ever two. If you send in a stronger flash of light, this one's four times stronger, you'll often get zero, but very often you'll get one, and sometimes you'll get two and maybe even three picoampere current coming out of that. All of those numbers, the heights of all those peaks, those are the multiple predictions of this theory with only one free fitting parameter. And uh, if they pan out, then we'll have strong evidence that not only is the light hypothesis correct, but that it actually matters for our vision. So in the black here, we've got uh, some experimental data. This is a histogram, it's drawn like a histogram. It lies right on top of that theoretical prediction. It looks like a promising theory. <clears throat> That's not Baylor's original data. It's something equivalent to Baylor's original data. Uh, of course, you see a whole lot, you see a few thousand trials in this data set. You gotta make a lot of trials. Not only is this distribution correctly predicted by theory, but uh, with no free fitting parameters, if I send in a signal that's four times greater, I know what this one ought to be as well, and that one lies on the curve without any more fitting. That seems like a good theory. Let's go back to that superhuman vision. Uh, first of all, Baylor and his colleagues, they also change, now you can do anything. You can change the color of that incoming flash of light and measure directly the sensitivity curves of over 100 primate cells. And uh, what do you know? They fall into three categories. There's three different kinds. Within each category, they all have the same uh, sensitivity curve. Uh, that's Thomas Young's prediction, which some young guessed in 1801. Then they used those curves to make that prediction of color matching, which I described earlier that was so successful, pretty good. We've tied up some loose ends in part one of this talk. Can we go now? Is that all? Well, hang on a little bit longer. We get something more. Once you really believe in the lumpy nature of light, then you can see how to make some more steps forward. Anybody can walk into Walmart and pick up a binocular, and that gives you superhuman vision. And you diddle it around, you get a microscope, that's superhuman vision. But even the most expensive microscope in the world still can't resolve objects that are too close together. If two objects are closer than the wavelength of light, then you won't be able to see them. That was dogma for over 100 years. People worked out the optics, and uh, that's how it goes. Uh, and that's really a pity, because visible light has a kind of a long wavelength, kind of too big to see the things that we really want to see inside of cells. You've got little motors, little molecular, single molecule motors in your cells. They're walking along tracks. Every time a muscle contracts, it's because these single molecule motors are walking along their little tracks. Unfortunately, they're too small to see. They're smaller than this uh, diffraction barrier. So it's not even enough to be superhuman. We want super resolution microscopy because of this randomness thing that we always saw. For instance, here's one of those molecular motors. You can't see the track that it's on, but the motor's been labeled fluorescently. And uh, it's making a rather fat spot there in the microscope. Uh, I, here's a video. Watch closely. Step. Step. That thing is taking little steps, but it's hard to see what's going on. It's hard to know what the step was because the steps are so much smaller than that broad smear of light, which, the, which is the best that any microscope can give you. But if you take any one frame of that video and make a histogram of position x and y versus how many photons you got, there's a bright spot somewhere and then it tails off. This distribution is fat, it's a couple hundred nanometers, but nevertheless, you can fit this to the shape that you know it has to have and find out where its center is to way greater precision than this width. If you collect enough photons, you can get as much precision as you want. You can get fluorescence imaging at one nanometer accuracy. And uh, when you graph the progress of that motor, here's time, here's position, it's one off the edge of the screen, you see step, step, pause, step, pause, step. You see these beautiful steps, they all have the same size. Uh, this thing is making steps of 70 nanometers and it's pausing by certain amounts, and even the lengths of these pauses are telling us something interesting about the mechanism by how this machine works, something we couldn't have seen if we hadn't understood superhuman vision. You could do better than that, too. You, you, can, you can take that same idea. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, my friends who invented this uh, like funny acronyms, so they called it FIONA, 
because uh, that stands for fluorescence imaging at one nanometer accuracy. Anything newer than that? Oh yeah. You can use that same idea in a different way to uh, make a family of techniques that call it, got called method of the year in 2008. Uh, here's a conventional fluorescence microscope. You see some stuff, some fibers, some little objects. It, it's kind of crappy. That's the best you can get because these things are too small to see with visible light. Until you apply that tr trick that I gave you on the previous slide, then the same image looks a whole lot better. In fact, it looks so good, you can take a little piece of it and blow it up and it still looks good. And you can see things that you couldn't see before, like the fact that these filaments are actually smaller than those red blobs, uh, something you couldn't see before. So understanding the lumpy statistical character of light has led us to microscopy methods that are opening our eyes to new things we couldn't see before, and that's good spy craft, I think. Right, so uh, many clues, including even things about our own personal vision, led us to a surprising conclusion about light itself. If we didn't have that understanding, we wouldn't have been able to imagine how to break the resolution barrier. I like that. I want to give, let Heinz Pagels have the last word. He says, I like to browse in occult bookshops. The factual contents of those books are almost entirely fraudulent, but what is not fraudulent is the depth they reveal of the human need for a spiritual connection to the forces of existence. Uh, that makes sense to me. So I told you some stories, and how do you know that they're different from occult voodoo? Well, we started out with some real reality. That's a good step. That led us to a paradox whose resolution turned out to be real fruitful. We followed our hero as he teased out the existence of unseen actors and mechanisms decades before their direct proof uh, using some mathematical ideas, and they weren't very difficult. And we discussed how you test a theory and why you should test a theory. Okay, it takes a lot of effort. It's not an armchair activity. This is called scientific research. It also costs money. We learned some lessons that translated into methods that have paid off in unexpected ways. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I just chose four for you, but there are lots of other examples. And we also learned something deep about physics, something about the character of light that people didn't used to know. We got a connection to the forces of exist woo, to the forces of existence, and uh, I like that too. So, you know, if there are any young people in the audience, you may be wondering, well, can I really do this? And I'd like just to emphasize once again, um, if you've got a personality type that's meticulous and likes craftsmanship, and if you just absolutely have to get to the bottom of things that don't fit, things that don't fit, then um, there are a lot of urgent problems that need to be solved. Okay? Um, and you never know in advance which of those problems is just about to give way to a breakthrough. And we need a lot of agents in the field so we can cover them all. And thank you very much. <laughs>